We continue our study of one of the first and most extensive texts in the Buddhist tradition, a Samana Pala Sutta, a Samana, Samanya is a philosopher, we might say, from our Western tradition. We can talk about the philosophers of old, perhaps ascetics, people who live an unusual life in order to be true to their spiritual principles and their realizations. This text gives us a comprehensive explanation of both the why and the how of this training. And it's good for us to wonder why and how do we train? Here we are, we've come all this way, setting aside a few days, a week, a few months, a few years, in order to do this training. <coughs> and it's good to ask, why? Why are we doing this? And it's good to ask, how? How do we do this? The why, the question why, is phrased <clears throat> as what is a fruit of the spiritual profession that's visible here and now? Is there any fruit? Can you point out a fruit, pala, a fruit of this path that we can really see here and now? So it isn't just uh, eventually after you die, you'll get reborn in heaven. Maybe, maybe not, I'm not sure, but what can you point out here and now? It's a good question. And it's asked by the king. A king, uh, of the time of Magadha, King Ajasattu. As we have learned, this particular king was in a great deal of pain when he asked this question. And why was he in so much pain? Why was he so distraught? This is very important for us to understand. He did what we have done. That's why he was so distraught. And what did he do? He, out of the desire to attain power, to gain power over the world, so he could make things be the way he wanted them to be, he killed his father, a righteous king, Bimbisada. He killed his father so that he could sit on the throne. And he succeeded in obtaining the throne. And so here he is as a king. He got what he wanted. He got power. Power over the whole realm. And with that act, he destroyed his life. He utterly destroyed his life. And at this point, we find him 
You find him lost, confused, distraught, horrified, unable to eat, unable to sleep, completely safe in all directions, surrounded by his armies. No one can challenge his power, and yet he's not safe at all. He's constantly attacked from within, and none of his armies can prevent his conscience from tearing at his heart. He is searching everywhere for someone who can bring him peace. Isn't there someone who can give peace to my mind? He tries to sleep and all he sees are images of his father suffering and dying in the way <clears throat> that he tortured and killed his father. He tries to eat, but he's incapable of consuming food. He doesn't know how to spend time with his family, his own son, who he loves. He doesn't know how to relate to his son anymore, having destroyed his relationship with his father. And so in that state, he comes to the Buddha, hoping that the Buddha will give him peace. And in his introduction to the question, he explains that he's already asked this question. Is there any fruit to the path of philosophy, of asceticism, that's visible here and now? He's asking about this because he's realized the meaninglessness of the profession that he's taken up. And it doesn't really matter. It doesn't really make any difference if you're the king. He's realized this. But he also can't see, does it make any difference if you're a monk? He doesn't know anymore. He's so confused. And so he introduces his question. And in introducing his question, he describes various doctrines that he's explored in hopes that they will give him peace. And it's important for us here to explore these doctrines because we are using these doctrines now in order to try, our, to, try to give ourselves peace. And what is it? that we have done that prevents us from sleeping at night. We didn't perhaps kill our father, but as we know, we are killing our mother. We're aware that Grandmother Earth is under attack. We, our species, and in particular our culture, is causing a terrible destruction of life. And we want to know what to do about it. What can we do about this? Is it okay that we're doing this? We need to explore this. We can look down, of course, on the king. King Ajasattu, of course, made a big mistake killing his father. However, we can be encouraged by him as well because he is unable to sleep, unable to eat, torn to shreds by his conscience. So 
So, strangely, that's encouraging. In the same way, we can be encouraged. We can look around this room. We can look at ourselves. We can feel encouraged by the fact that we're bothered by the lives we live and the minds that we live from. We see that something has to change, something has to be done, and we don't know what it is. Of course, it would be easier, wouldn't it, to not be worried about it. So what? Doesn't really matter, does it? And even if we admit that it does matter, at least we could just blame other people. That would be easier. A lot of things would be easier. It's not me, it's not my mind. It's not my culture, it's not my species. It's just something or other. And so what anyway? Of course, that would be easier. And it's worth looking closely. Why did the king have so much trouble sleeping? This is important for us to look at because it's a question that relates to each of us. We <clears throat> can examine these doctrines. Each of these doctrines, of course, is provided by a certain teacher, and we will continue to move through the other teachers in this retreat, but it's worth reviewing the doctrines that we've already looked at, at least in order to review the courage and the eloquence of the teachers who profess these doctrines. It's very impressive. Nowadays, we have these doctrines. These are powerful doctrines nowadays. But there are few people who are able to express them as concisely, with such cogent clarity as these teachers here. So it's worth looking at them. Now the king had already gone to a teacher named Purana Kasappa, and he asked him, can you point out any fruit of asceticism, of philosophy, of the spiritual life, which is visible here and now? And Purana Kasappa said the following. The doctrine is this. If one acts or induces others to act, mutilates or induces others to mutilate, tortures or induces others to torture, inflicts sorrow or induces others to inflict sorrow, oppresses or induces others to oppress, intimidates or induces others to intimidate. If one destroys life, takes what is not given, breaks into houses, plunders wealth, commits burglary, ambushes highways, commits adultery, speaks falsehood, one does no evil. There it is. Very powerful doctrine, isn't it? and one that's very popular nowadays. One does those things, one doesn't do evil. If with a razor-edged weapon, one were to reduce all the living beings on this earth to a single heap of bloody flesh, by doing so there would be no evil or outcome of evil. As you see here, it's a very popular doctrine nowadays. 
If one were to go along the south bank of the Ganges, killing and inducing others to kill, mutilating and inducing others to mutilate, torturing and inducing others to torture, by doing so there would be no evil or outcome of evil. If one were to go along the north bank of the Ganges giving gifts and inducing others to give gifts, making offerings and inducing others to make offerings, by doing so there would be no merit, no good, or outcome of merit. By giving self-control, restraint, and truthful speech, there is no merit or outcome of merit. Very powerful doctrine, isn't it? I have felt enormously grateful for the explication of this doctrine in this text. Because as I've read it, as I've studied it, and as I've examined my own mind, I found this doctrine present in my thoughts much more often than I thought I would. It just doesn't really matter. Yeah, sometimes you have to cut down a forest. I mean, that's how it goes. It's not bad. Killing all those living beings is just the way it is. There's, it's not evil, it's just how it is. Of course people have to be oppressed. I mean, that's just how it is. What can you do? It's just life. Deal with it. Giving, self-control, that's good as long as people watch you doing it and you get credit, but it doesn't have any inherent value. And here we are, destroying life on this planet. I mean, what can you do? It's just how it goes. I find this doctrine powerful in my mind as an easy escape from my conscience. Conscience is saying, no, it's really not okay. We can't do this. We have to do something different. I don't know what it is, but it can't be this. Oh, it doesn't matter. Killing isn't evil. I mean, if you get caught, people will be mad at you, so you shouldn't do it, but it doesn't actually matter. It's a strong doctrine. It's powerful. We want to believe it. Because it allows us to enter a, a dream within this dream. We live in a dream in which we don't matter. And this doctrine is the dream that verifies the validity of the dream that created it. We want to think that it's all just relative, you know, different cultures, they say different things. Some cultures say this is good, other cultures say that's bad. Who knows? I mean, come on. It's too confusing anyway. We all just made it up. All of this morality stuff is just programmed into our brains. Some kind of evolutionary dis uh, explanation must be there somehow. We'll find it eventually. It's all just pretend. I know for me, I lived in many different countries, and different countries, it's true, have different ideas of what's good and bad. And I think we've been a bit bamboozled. We've been disoriented after our colonial uh, fiesta. Meeting so many cultures, it's confusing because all the cultures say different things and the only thing that's consistent is we got to destroy them. That's all. We just have to indoctrinate. That's all we know. Because everything y'all are saying is really hard to understand. I was in Japan, and you have to act this way. In India, I have to act this other way. 
both are different from where I grew up in the U.S. I mean, who knows? Let's not think about this anymore. It doesn't matter. That sure would be easy. Many of you know the story. There I was in India. It's my job to teach those young boys that untouchability is an evil doctrine. But I quickly realized that if I would just treat them like the untouchables that they believe they are, they obeyed me. That was a lot easier. It's a lot easier to just go along with the flow of the world so I did. And whoo, I felt a lot better. I could sleep at night. It was great. They weren't bothering me all the time. I just looked down on them, considered them worthless, just like they wanted me to. And everybody was happy. Whew, I sure did solve all those problems. Of course, I make fun of myself, but I have sympathy for myself as well. It was a hard job. And it wasn't so easy to break out of that and remember, no, do not become the evil that you're trying to overcome. You gotta fight. You gotta bring forth strength here to follow our conscience somehow. And so we move on to another doctrine, a different one, not this amoral approach to life, but a deeper, a more sophisticated doctrine, the doctrine of determinism. <clears throat> this doctrine, as many of you know, is very popular nowadays. And a good portion of our modern priesthood that being scientists, are explicitly dedicated to proving this doctrine to be true. Explicitly. They say it. That's our goal. We want to show that determinism is the case. And so, naturally, we find a certain amount of evidence for it. The doctrine is stated by the teacher Makali Gosala at the time of the Buddha as follows. This is him responding to the question posed to him by the king. He says, There is no cause or condition for the defilement of beings. Beings are defiled without any cause or condition. This defilement means suffering. There is no cause or condition for suffering. Suffering just exists. It's just how it is. There is no cause or condition for the purification of beings. Beings are purified without cause or condition. I mean, there's nothing you can do in order to become liberated from suffering. It happens without any cause or condition. There is no self-determination. No determination by others. No personal determination. There is no power, no energy, no personal strength, no personal fortitude. All sentient beings, all living beings, all creatures, all souls are helpless, powerless, devoid of energy, undergoing transformation by destiny, fate, and nature. They experience pleasure and pain. So, nowadays we have to work with the doctrine of determinism. Seems like it could be the case. There are just chemicals. They just bump into each other. Stuff happens. There's no one there who could do anything about it. You have no choices. And chemicals in your brain just do this and that, and then you do this and that. There's no one there who can do anything about it. 
Try to do something about it, you can't. There are no choices, no decisions. You have no power, no energy, no strength, no fortitude. There is no self-determination. Again, <clears throat> this is very tempting. Feels exciting, doesn't it, to think about it? Oh, good. Well, in that case, there was nothing we could do. It's fantastic. Homo sapiens, this particular version of human beings, just has to kill stuff. We just have to kill the other forms of human beings. We don't have any choice. We have to kill the other sorts of animals and life. That's just how it is. Nothing can be done. There's just a deterministic line of events that's resulted in us destroying life. Okay, what can you do? And nowadays, we're destroying even aspects of Homo sapiens, destroying cultures, languages, oppressing people. What can you do? Nothing, that's what. There's nothing that can be done. You have no choices. You are powerless. And because you're powerless, you don't have responsibility. So, Makali Gosala naturally asks, his doctrine brings forth the question, why do you feel so bad about killing your father? You couldn't help it. In the same way that Purana Kasapa asked, why do you feel so bad about killing your father? Killing's not evil. It doesn't make any difference, or in this case of this doctrine, you don't make any difference. There's nothing you can do about it. There's just destiny, fate, nature. That's all. I, as many of you know, have a medical condition that results in certain mood changes, emotional shifts. I've had it since I was a child, and in high school, one of the main things that drew me to this path was the question, is there anything else? So there's a chemical shift, and then I feel angry. There's another chemical shift, and then I feel giddy. Is it all just chemicals? Is it all just a, a circumstance over which I have no power? I needed to find out. In the same way that the king needed to find out. And because of his direct experience of his concern, his love for his father, which he didn't even know about, he needed to continue on beyond both of these two doctrines. And so he went to Ajita Kesakambala, who gave another doctrine, which is nowadays presented as a kind of a modern doctrine, even though it's very old. And it's presented as a secular doctrine, even though it's uh, anything but secular. It's utterly religious based on blind faith in a way that no other doctrine that I know of is to such an extent. It's important to note that this is that what you're about to hear is based on pure, absolute blind faith and uh, tricky rhetoric. So he went to <clears throat> this teacher and asked the same question, that teacher said the following. There is no giving, no offering, no generosity. There is no fruit or result of good and bad actions. There is no present world, no world beyond, no mother, no father, no beings who have taken rebirth. In the world, there are no philosophers and ascetics, no priests and practitioners of right attainment and right practice who explain this world and the world beyond on the basis of their own direct knowledge and realization. 
A person is composed of the four primary elements. This is the most important sentence here. A person is composed of the four primary elements. The four primary elements in this case are earth, water, fire, and air. But the point here is a person is composed of matter. That's the point being made here. This is materialism. When they die, the earth returns to earth, the water returns to water, the fire returns to fire, the air returns to air, the sense faculties pass over into space. Four people carry the corpse along on a bier. Eulogies are sounded until they reach the charnel ground. The bones turn pigeon colored. Meritorious offerings end in ashes. The practice of giving is a doctrine of fools. Those who declare that there is an afterlife, that there's a world beyond, speak only false, empty prattle. With the breaking up of the body, the foolish and the wise alike are annihilated and utterly perish. They do not exist after death. This is materialism, although it's interesting that in this text, it's referred to as annihilationism which is better translated as there is not-ism. That's a literal translation of the term, there isn't-ism, is what is being said here. So there's matter, and that's it. There's just chemicals. There's matter. We're not sure what matter is exactly, at least Ajita Kesa Kambala was clear about what matter is, at least he said it's the four primary elements. Nowadays, we realize that the world isn't just the four primary elements, so we keep on expanding the definition of matter to include everything that we discover so that the doctrine isn't disproven. And we hold to it in order to believe, in order to hold on to the idea that with the breaking up of the body, the foolish and the wise alike are annihilated. Why? Because there was no one there in the first place. There was nothing there. There's just chemicals, and then consciousness, experience, living beings are just some kind of consequence of those chemicals. We're not sure exactly how that happens, but we're certain that that's what happens. We know that we do not exist after death. We're confident in that. Why? Well, simple. Because then your father's not suffering. He's good. There's no suffering anymore. You liberated him from his suffering when you killed him. It's no problem. And besides, after you die, all of the suffering that you have right now, it's just going to go away. So don't worry about it. As it was put by one of our Western most famous materialists, when we are, death is not. When death is, we are not. Therefore, there's nothing to worry about. There is nothing to worry about. Nothing at all. It doesn't make any difference. Of course, he, ancient Greek philosopher, taught that therefore hedonism was the solution. Epicurus taught hedonism as a result of materialism. Ajita Kesakambala taught the opposite. He taught pain as a result of materialism because it doesn't matter if you're in pain. It's just good to know that hedonism is not a natural consequence of materialism. However, it's also good to know that whereas Ajita Kesakambala's form of materialism didn't last very long, we are all Epicureans nowadays in the modern world. We love that doctrine. Well, it's all just matter, so it doesn't matter. So let's watch a movie. Let's eat some popcorn and let's not worry about all the living beings who we're killing. To do something about it is the practice of giving, and the practice of giving is a doctrine of fools. That's where we're at right now. Interesting, isn't it? We're trying to fundraise around here, trying to encourage people to give. But people don't like to give. People like to take. 
People feel much more comfortable paying for things than giving. <laughs> it's fascinating how deep this doctrine has gone in our hearts. But the king couldn't accept it because he knew that what he had done mattered. In the same way that we here, we can't accept it. We can't be okay with it. We are worried. We are concerned. And so we come to another doctrine, a similar doctrine, but this doctrine is not there isn't ism. This doctrine is there is ism. That's the point of this doctrine. There really is a person. And it's taught as follows by Pakudha Kachayana. He told the king, there are seven entities that are unmade, unfashioned, uncreated, without a creator, barren, stable as a mountain peak, standing firm like a pillar. This is also very, this is a kind of philosophy similar to this materialism. These seven bodies are unmade, unfashioned, uncreated, without a creator. <clears throat> they don't alter, they do not change, they don't obstruct each other. They're incapable of causing one another pleasure or pain. What are the seven? Earth, water, fire, air, pleasure, pain, and the soul. So in this case, it's thought that these are eternal, unmade, unchanging entities. And the soul is one of them. So this is the teaching that we, that of course, there is matter, but there's also an eternal soul. And that soul is separate from and invulnerable to all events, all changes of, the, of these seven entities. Therefore, this is very important, the logic is absolutely clear, because you have an eternal soul, the following logical conclusions make perfect sense. There is no killer or one who causes killing. If you have an eternal soul, no one can kill you. If someone else has an eternal soul, you can't kill them. So there's absolutely nothing wrong with cutting their head off. There's no problem. They have an eternal soul, remember? You couldn't kill them. It's impossible. Furthermore, there is no hearer or one who causes hearing. So this is perceiving the world, perceiving the external world, it's not possible to do that because it's clear that perception is changing right now, but nothing changes. Therefore, no one hears, no one causes hearing, no one hears, no one speaks. That's the reality. There's no cognizer nor one who causes cognition. There's no one who knows anything. Why? Because this eternal soul doesn't change. The eternal soul didn't know this and then it did know this, then something would have changed in it. But it doesn't change. It's eternal. That eternal soul is what matters. The eternal soul doesn't see, it doesn't hear, it doesn't know, it doesn't do. Therefore, because we all have eternal souls, if someone were to cut off another person's head with a sharp sword, they would not be taking the other's life. The sword merely passes through the space between the seven entities. So this is there isism. That means you really exist. The other was there isn'tism. You really don't exist. If you really don't exist, then it doesn't matter if you kill because you're not killing anyone. If you really do exist, it doesn't matter if you kill because you're not killing anyone. And again, <clears throat> we take this one very seriously nowadays. We see it very, very commonly in our politics. It doesn't matter what we do. We're all just going to go to heaven eternally anyway. It doesn't make any difference. This world is just an illusion. The real person who doesn't die, that's what matters. Not all of this worldly stuff. So don't worry about it. Don't worry. It doesn't matter. It's essential for us to look at this very closely. Why? <clears throat> because it's all too common for us 
to be tempted by doctrine into ignoring our conscience, to ignoring what we know is true, ignoring what we know matters. And when we lose track of that, we lost track of the precious jewel that guides a good life. We're here in order to examine our deep assumptions, our deep attachment to certain ways of looking at things, so that we can drop those that are unskillful and damaging. Of course, it's not easy to do this. We know that. <laughs> it's why we should look around and be so impressed. That's why. We need to look around and be very impressed. Impressed that we're here, interested in meditating. And what is meditating? Meditating is letting go of our views. Letting go of the way we see things. And each of us should ask ourselves if we really want to do that. We should look at that very closely. Is that something I'm really interested in doing? Am I interested in letting go of the way I look at things? And we can look around and know that we're surrounded by people who are unusually interested in that, who are unusually willing to question their perspectives, and to be guided in that questioning by a compassion for all beings. This is something to be grateful for, something to admire, something to rejoice in. Because the desperation, the distress, that comes from realizing that we have killed countless living beings, that that isn't okay and it has to change now, that can give us hope, that can give us faith. That distress is what gives us faith. That horror is what leads to joy, to confidence, to power. And this power is a power that we should have. To gain this kind of power is good for the world. Saves the world. Take advantage of this opportunity. Take advantage of this opportunity for yourself. Take advantage of the opportunity that we have being with each other. Make use of your technique in order to examine your own mind very carefully. Become free from unwholesome habits and realize a totally new perspective on the world.